Good morning and welcome to our worship service. We also extend a warm welcome to all those who may be visiting and to those who are live streaming or listening in by phone. May we all be blessed as God's word is proclaimed and may his name receive all the honor, glory and praise. I have uh, one announcement, um, a reminder for this Tuesday, November 26th at 7.30, we will have um, our fall membership budget meeting and the, um, the budget, like it's, it's in your mailboxes so you can pick them up after the service. Our call to worship this morning comes to us from Lamentations 3 verses 22 and 23. Through the, Lord, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let us now sing to God's praise from our songbooks, number 27, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Number 27, all three verses, all three verses. Congregation, the Lord has called us together to worship him, and we confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth, and in Christ Jesus is an overflowing fountain of good. Amen. Receive the greeting of the Lord, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, in the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us praise God with singing from Psalter number 51. All the stanzas of number 51.
As we hear the law of our King, the King of all kings, let us do so with a humble heart. Let us do so in a way that we are directed to Christ, who is the Savior of sinners, who has fulfilled the law and died also under the curse of the law. And let us hear the law also with a prayer to the Lord to revive our hearts so that we may walk in His perfect way. We'll hear the law from Exodus 20, and then the summary from Mark 12, and afterwards sing from 391, Psalter 391, all four stanzas. It's a prayer to the Lord. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children, to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's, which is the first commandment of all. Jesus answered, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like it, and is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. Psalter number 391.
Let us turn now in the New Testament to the Gospel of Luke and read from chapter 1. And our text will be verse 5 through 25, but let's start at verse 1. Since we read the introduction, study that last week, and it'd be good just to hear it once more and as we move into the rest of, of the book. So page 1577 for, our, for the beginning of our scripture reading from Luke 1, verse 1 through 25, and our text being 5 through 25. Let us hear together the word of God. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias. For your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now, after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. So far the reading of God's holy, infallible, inspired, and inerrant word. And let us come to the Lord in prayer, and in our prayer, in addition to the matters mentioned in the bulletin, we want to thank the Lord that Janet Dunning was able to come home from the hospital yesterday, and we will pray for her. She still waits for a number of weeks before she gets conclusive or hopefully conclusive determination as to what's wrong with her, but we're thankful that she may be home. And we also want to pray for Dirk Bierstaker, who was yesterday in the hospital. First, there was concern of, of heart trouble. He was having chest pains, but he has since returned to his place at West Park, and they've determined that he's suffering from an infection, and so we'll pray for healing for him. Let us come to God in prayer. 
great and glorious God, creator and keeper and savior. We bow before you in the morning of this new day and we praise you for how great you are and how greatly to be praised. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your judgments are a great deep. Your righteousness, your righteousness are like the great mountains. And Lord, we confess that it is you who preserve man and beast. And how precious is your loving kindness. And therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. May that be the spirit in which we come to your house this morning, seeking to rest under the shadow of your wings seeking to take refuge in you, in all of your promises, in all of your faithfulness, and above all in your beloved Son, whom you have sent into this world to be the Redeemer of his people, and who has given himself so entirely on the cross, so that all who turn to him and trust in him may be forgiven every sin. We may even hear from you that our sins have been cast behind your back, have been cast into the depths of the sea. And so there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But we confess that left to ourselves, we have reason only to expect condemnation. And even this past week, Lord, proves that once more our sins are many and our sins are great. But Christ is greater still. And his blood cleanses from all sin. And so we, we pray today, Lord, that we may flee to him and trust in him. And we pray that today we may deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. And we pray that also in corporate worship, we may, together as a people, and with all the saints, be able to take in the, the width and length and breadth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, and to be filled with all the fullness of God. You have brought us here, O oh Lord, will you bless us here? Will you be present with us with your Holy Spirit? And will you be glorified even as you engage with us, and we, by your grace and power seek to engage with you we thank you for blessings received in this past week particular blessings and we commend you and praise you for the surgery of jay rulofson that he could have that surgery on wednesday after so long a time waiting for it and finally being able to receive it and to hear afterwards that it went very well that he could return home the next day lord we thank you for this we hear we see in this also answered prayer, and we pray for your further mercy to Jay and strength for him as he, as he has begun a long recovery. Give him patience and grant healing to him, and grant, Lord, that by way of this surgery, he may experience a greater degree of health and strength and, and liberty for a long time to come. We pray that for him, and that you may also continue to bless him spiritually and to sanctify this trial in his life, this experience for his good, for his well-being. We pray for his wife and family, and we rejoice, O oh Lord, with all of them. We also thank you that Janet Dunning could come home from the hospital after being almost two weeks there, and we thank you that she is a bit stronger also than when she first entered the hospital, and we pray that you will be with her as tests have been done and as she awaits diagnoses, and we Lord, commend to you the medical staff and all of the expertise that you have given to them that they may be able to, to, to find out what is wrong and if possible also to treat what is wrong and that we may see Janet restored more even and that she may even be able to return to worship and to be given some time yet with her husband and family. We pray for Bert and Janet together and for your blessing on them and their family today. We pray for Dirk Beersager that you will be with him as he was in the hospital yesterday. We thank you that he can be back in his room and we pray for him that he may recover as well through the medication that he may receive and the care that is given to him. We pray for him too also in body and soul. Lord we rejoice with Nate and Caressa Campice that you gave to them earlier this week a healthy baby girl and we pray Lord that you will bless this little one Madison Carolyn together with her mother and father that you will equip these parents to raise their child in the fear of your name and that you will bless Madison with an early love for you, a fervent desire to serve you all the days of her life. We rejoice with her and her and the entire extended family at your goodness to them. And Lord God, we pray for all of us, every, 
every family and every member, everyone you have brought into the sanctuary this morning. We thank you for many mercies received, many blessings enjoyed. We thank you for overall health and strength. We also bring before you many cares and concerns. We pray for those, Lord, who are struggling. Maybe they are fearful or they are anxious or maybe they are depressed, downcast, perhaps even despairing. We pray, Lord, for those who find themselves in difficulty this morning or in these days or in these weeks and months, in the valley even of the shadow of death. Remember them. We pray for them that you will be near to them even today, that you will minister to them by your grace and show them, give, the, give them a glimpse of the beauty and glory of Christ and thrill their hearts with his his presence, His promises, His faithfulness, how He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that they may experience being lifted up in their hearts. We pray, Lord, for those for whom home life is hard, for various reasons, that You will remember them. We pray for wisdom as we live in a confusing and chaotic world. We pray that we may not be distressed. We pray that we may take refuge in You, that we may be able to say with the psalmist, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? God is our refuge and strength. We will not fear. We pray, Lord, that we may so lay hold of you by faith and walk by faith all the days of our life. We pray that you will bless our fellowship as a congregation. Bless the worship services today. Bless, Lord, our offering of gifts, our singing of praises. Bless, too, the Sunday school that meets after the service. Be with them and their teachers we thank you for their teachers and we pray that you will equip them for the work that they do, for the teaching that they do, and that you will bless the seed of the word. Oh God, grant that it may be the seed of new life throughout this whole day. New life is what we need and reviving is what we need and strengthening is what we need and we pray for that, Lord, and equipping also for the work of ministry in this world in which we live. We pray to a God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To you be the glory, also in and through the church, now and forevermore. Amen. Let us continue to worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings, giving for the church and for the ministry of Shalom Manor, thankful for that institution and this morning, several of our office bearers are there for the service. We are a part of a church rotation with a number of supporting churches where every so often two or three office bearers join with Pastor Peter Jansen's for the service and also offer support and, and care for our members who are there. So that is happening this morning. After the offering, we will sing from Psalter number 408, 408, and we will sing all three stanzas. Ye who is temple throng, Jehovah's praise prolong.
Well, beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have Luke 1, 5 to 25. It's a big text, and there's so much about this text that deserves our attention and reflection. For example, if we think of Zacharias, he was a priest. Zacharias. And we're told that he was part of a priestly division, Abijah's division. In the Old Testament already, in, in 1 Chronicles 24, we read about how the priesthood was organized there were so many priests, and so they had to have structure, and they were organized into 24 divisions, and each division served in the temple for a week, twice a year. And then during the special feasts, they all served all together, all the divisions. And so we're told about Zacharias, he's part of this division of Abijah, and, and it's his week to serve in the temple. We're also told about his wife, Elizabeth how she was a priest's daughter. So she too was from the family line of Aaron, the first priest. And at some point when they were younger, these two, Zacharias and Elizabeth, they, they met and eventually they married. And by now they had lived many years together as husband and wife. And that's of course wonderful to be married a long time if God gives that. But also, the way they are described in verse 6, so beautifully, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Now, that doesn't mean that they were perfect. After all, who can be? They were not perfect, but they were godly. There was an overall consistency in their life. Indeed, we can say there was an increasing conformity to the image of the Son of God, whom they did not yet know in, 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 in person, in the flesh, like He was about to be made known. But, but that was beginning to be reflected in their life. They were God-fearing, and they sought to be obedient. This couple, they lived by faith in the Lord. They looked to Him. They trusted in Him. They hoped in His word of promise. And you know, whenever people do that, inevitably... It begins to show up in their life. Because the grace of God is so powerful that it changes people. That when you embrace it, it transforms you. Jesus will later say that a good tree bears good fruit. In fact, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And that means that when you're a true believer, you cannot live in sin. Instead, you're continually and more and more turning from sin and turning to the Lord and repenting and believing and, and seeking to live in new obedience. That's what happens in the lives of God's people. We know that, don't we? If it's not happening in your life, then you ought to question whether you are truly saved yet or not. Because, because this is one of the marks. And it was happening in the lives of Zacharias and Elizabeth. And again, it was beautiful to see. They were both righteous before God walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Had we been able to know them, we would have loved to know them. They would have been a blessing to be around. And yet at the same time, the text tells us that they carried, they carried a very deep sorrow. As verse 7 says, they had no child. They had no child. And now they were old and it was so impossible at this point, very likely they had long given up any hope of that ever changing. And some of you know the sorrow of Zacharias and Elizabeth, and you understand it very, very well. How heavy and difficult it must have been for this couple, just as it may be, or was, or maybe still is for some today. Elizabeth will refer to it even as a reproach, verse 25. Now, not everyone may feel that way, but in her case, she did. My reproach, she says, among people. And regrettably, in those days, it was common for Israelite women like Elizabeth to be viewed with a measure of suspicion. Zacharias and Elizabeth together. If you were truly good before God, He would bless you with kids. What have you done to deserve no children? Now, that was altogether wrong. It was a Job's friends kind of mentality. It was wrong, but it was real. 
and Zacharias and Elizabeth had to bear it. The reproach and the reality of no children. And so what this text is teaching us is that even when we are godly people, we are not necessarily immune to sorrow and grief. Zacharias and Elizabeth were exemplary. And yet their home never overflowed with the joyful shouts and squeals of many children, never mind many more grandchildren. All the years so far in their life, it was just the two of them. And yet despite what they missed, they served the Lord still. And, and we have every reason to believe that they did so overall in a cheerful way. Because that, is that not also one of the commands of God? To serve Him with gladness. To serve Him well, no matter what His way may be with us. That is His command. And Zacharias and Elizabeth, they kept His commands. They had learned, even as they sorrowed over what they missed, they had learned to trust the Lord and to be content with His way. That's a holy challenge, isn't it, for all of us? Whatever our personal situation may be, whether, whether no children or not as many children as we might like, or maybe other things. Maybe you find yourself in life not where you thought you'd be. Instead, enduring many disappointments, marriage-wise, family-wise, health-wise, money-wise. It's true, isn't it? Life can be difficult for all kinds of reasons. And while it is not wrong to desire goods, God's good gifts, and we may even pray for them, it's right to. But if the Lord doesn't give, will we serve Him still? Cheerfully, contentedly, faithfully, fruitfully. Holy challenge, to be sure. We need God's help. But now in our text the situation for Zacharias and Elizabeth is about to change in a very dramatic way. And not only that, but what, what, what is about to happen will have an impact for all people, including you and me. Because what the rest of the text describes is the coming of an angel named Gabriel. And he comes with good news, glad tidings, he says, which means good news. That's the text. And just think of that. In terms of the history, an angel is about to speak. For how many hundreds of years heaven had been silent? For so long, no fresh word from God. And the years go by and the centuries and heaven is still until, until suddenly God says to Gabriel, Go, go to Zacharias. Even now as he's in the temple, in the holy place, offering incense up to heaven, go to Zacharias and speak to him good news. And let's hear all about that now. Let's hear that from this text. God sends Gabriel to Zacharias with good news. And after that longer, maybe introduction, longer one, let's highlight three things. Number one, the prayer God's heard. The prayer he's heard. Because notice verse 11, right when Zacharias is offering incense and all the people are waiting outside, it may have been the morning sacrifice or else the evening we're not sure, but everyone's waiting. And Zacharias is busy laying the incense on the coals of fire and overseeing the cloud rising up to heaven. And suddenly, as we know, an angel is there on the right side. And, and of course, Zacharias is afraid because we don't see angels every day and they're heavenly and glorious. And what does the angel say yet to Zacharias? Do not be afraid, Zacharias. He knew his name. Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. So first question, what prayer was heard? And the answer has to be twofold. One is Zechariah's prayer for a child. How often he and Elizabeth must have prayed through the years for the Lord to give them children. They knew. They knew that the Lord is the one who opens the womb and closes the womb. They knew that the Lord is the giver of life. The Lord gives. He creates. That's not something man is altogether in charge of. It belongs. It's the sovereign prerogative of God. He's in charge. And just like any and every godly couple throughout history, 
Don't we bring all our cares and concerns and requests to the Lord? Don't we learn to call upon Him for everything, including the God-given desire and longing to be a father and a mother? No doubt Zacharias and Elizabeth prayed many times about this, at least in the past. It may even have been their daily prayer, morning and evening, for weeks and months and years. Lord, will you not give us a child? How long they had prayed for that. By now, however, they had likely stopped praying for that because now they were old and they were well advanced in years. And probably they had concluded in God's providence, in God's good and wise providence, we're not meant to be parents. They had prayed and seemingly he had answered their prayer. He had said no. And that's his right, and we recognize that. He's sovereign. He decides everything. And, and, and again, that's not always easy for us. With, with this issue, maybe in your life or, or, or other issues, not easy. Adversity is a real thing in Christian experience. And yet God is God. And God is good. He's always good. And so they had prayed in the past just like maybe you have prayed or are praying now. They had prayed. And suddenly, now they learn God has heard and God is about to answer their prayers or about to change the answer to their prayers because soon they will have a son. Gabriel makes that clear. And how amazing that is, obviously, and wonderfully, a son is on the way or will be very soon. But is that all that is meant by the words, your prayer is heard? Is it only about the Lord now finally giving a, a child to Zacharias and Elizabeth? Don't we have to say that more must be in view? Just thinking about where Zacharias is in this moment and what he's doing. He's serving as a priest. He's in the holy place. He's so near to God on behalf of the people. They are outside. They are praying. Verse 10, the people are praying. And likewise, it was the priest's responsibility offering incense. With that, he was to pray for the people, for the nation, for God's mercy and blessing, for God's face to shine, for his salvation to appear. The people were praying. The priest was praying because how desperate the people were on so many levels. Politically, of course, they were subject to Rome and and Herod was their king, and he was an evil man. They were oppressed politically, nationally, but even more so spiritually. Whether they knew it or not, they needed God's intervention. They needed his help. They needed the Redeemer to come to Zion. And the people were praying, therefore, and Zacharias was, was praying and surely this too, if not especially, was what the angel meant when he said to Zacharias, Do not be afraid. Your prayer is heard. And as it turns out, with the gift and blessing the Lord is about to announce, he will answer both prayers. The long-uttered personal prayer of this couple for a child and the prayers of Zacharias as priest together with the people. Their unceasing prayers for the work of the Lord, for his face to shine yet once more. And for the people to be restored, God will answer both prayers. And what is more, the one prayer he answers will be the key to the other prayer being answered. For the son he sends to Zacharias and Elizabeth will be the herald of the coming Redeemer. But before we get to that, let's not miss this point about prayer. For truly the Lord our God is a prayer-hearing God and a prayer-answering God. We need to believe that. Do you believe that? Prayer hearing and prayer answering. The text confirms that, doesn't it? Your prayer is heard. Now, that does not mean that every child, this couple that prays for a child, will no doubt receive a child. Some will. 
maybe even in unexpected ways. Some will, but, but not all. The takeaway is not that if we pray, we receive no doubt for sure right now anything and everything we ask for. A child or healing or very clear direction or a promotion or reviving or some other blessing, whether personal or family or in church. Prayer is never a magic formula. Say the words, out comes the blessing. No, no, that's not true prayer. God is always sovereign. And he cannot be coerced and he cannot be forced. And we have to say, your will be done. And we need to pray in, in the spirit of faith. He may say yes to us. He may say no to us. He may say not now or not yet or not in this way. He may say so many things to us. But having said that, of one thing we can be absolutely sure, truly, He hears us. Even when it may seem like He doesn't. It's only if we're living in sin that He won't hear. You remember Psalm 66, if in my heart I sin, regard my prayer he will not hear. But if we're not doing that, if we're not living in sin, if we're seeking to live openly before the Lord, with all our struggles still, then whatever we bring to him, whatever care or trial or burden or struggle or request or agony or sorrow, when we pray, heaven hears. So that's how God has Gabriel begin. Do not fear, Zacharias. Your prayer is heard. So what happens? Let's think more, more about that now. The child he is sending, the second point. Because Zacharias, because Gabriel goes on to speak about this. Now, here in our congregation, we are receiving many children. This year in particular, I think it may be a record year for us. And every child is special, and every birth is to be celebrated but you know, something about the, the child in our text, not born yet, not even conceived, but what the angel says about him tells us he is extraordinary. Just the fact that he will be born to old people. In that sense, he's miraculously conceived and born. But notice too how the Lord determines what he's to be called. You shall call his name John. Which, as we'll see in a later sermon, everyone thinks is odd because there is no John in Zacharias' family. But the Lord wants him to be called John. And let's not miss the reason why. Do you know what John means? John means simply God is gracious. God is gracious. And the Lord wants people to know that. They haven't heard from him for, for so long. Now they get a fresh word. And the first word is this boy has the name John. And so with an unexpected name for an unexpected child, the Lord is sending a clear message. Let everyone be moved and amazed by it. God is gracious. Do you know that about God? Does that draw your heart out to God? Even when you may struggle with the ways of God, do you believe He is gracious? And people will hear about this because verse 14, not only Zacharias and Elizabeth have joy and gladness. We'll, we can believe that, of course. A child of their old age. What an incredible blessing. But the text goes on to say, many will rejoice at his birth. That's a signal that John will be extraordinary. So, and so far in terms of the words of Gabriel, we can, we can only wonder and be amazed. But then he begins to be specific. Verse 15, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. That's simply about John being set apart by the Lord for the Lord. No wine or strong drink. That was a rule for priests, you know, when they were on duty. No wine or strong drink. We, we learned that back in Leviticus earlier this year. It was also a rule required of Israelites when they took special vows. Vows that were known in the Old Testament as, as Nazarite vows. You can read more about that in number six. If, if someone felt compelled to be devoted to God in a particular way, not necessary for life, but for a season... If you did that, there were rules. And one of the rules was no wine or strong drink during the course of your vow. Now here in the case of John, the Lord says nothing about Nazarite vows, but when he says no wine or strong drink all his life, the point is that John must be set apart for God. It's like he will be a lifelong Nazarite devoted to God. That's how Zacharias and Elizabeth need to raise him. He must be set apart 
And something else about that, still verse 15, he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. So the Holy Spirit will come and enter John already when he is conceived and before he is born so that we can say he will be reborn before he is born. He will have a second birth before he has his first birth. He will be unique in that way, utterly set apart to God. And why? Well, here we come to what's all important. Verses 16 and 17, John's calling and purpose in life. The Lord tells Zacharias, verse 16, about John, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him, that's the Lord, he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, what's that all about? Very simply about John's, John's calling and purpose to summon people to repent. He will turn, says Gabriel. Twice he says it. John will turn. Turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. He will turn them. See, God will use John to bring many people to repentance. And notice how he will do it in the spirit and power of Elijah. Of course, we remember Elijah. He was one of the first major prophets of the Old Testament. And remember how bold he was, how intense he was, how persistent he was, not afraid even to call out kings and queens. Now he had his moments of struggle too and weakness, but overall, Elijah was a man on fire. And John will be like that as he calls people to repentance. There will be no escaping the directness of John, the precision of John, the boldness of John, as he urges people and compels people to get ready for God to appear. And how important it was to prepare the people for that. Because how many Israelites needed to repent for so much. They had forsaken the Lord. That was one of their problems, really their foundational issue. They were worshiping idols. They were living in service to false gods, gods of their own understanding and imagination. Instead of lifting themselves up to see the living God, they brought God down and fashioned Him in various ways according to their own sinful ideas and imaginations. They needed to hear John say to them, Turn, for why will you die? Turn to the Lord your God. John will also call out fathers, pleading with them to turn to their children. What's that about? It's a quotation from Malachi, where there is a prophecy concerning John. And the point seems to be that one of the effects of John's ministry will be repentance at home. He will call for repentance at home. Because isn't that so often where repentance first needs to happen. Repentance before God, yes, of course, that's where it starts, but subsequent to that, repentance at home. One of the commentators makes a point about this, that in the days of the Roman Empire, fathers were not often good. They were extremely strict many times, rarely tender and kind. Instead, overly harsh and even abusive was too often the norm, and as a result, we can well believe family life was not good, not healthy. When a father is a cruel taskmaster at home, he's sinning. Not that he never has rules or, or never enforces them, we, we shouldn't misunderstand, but, but when he's a tyrant, when everyone had better serve him or else, when he's not open to any reason, when he's full of himself, when instead of serving his family, he's lording it over his family. What a disaster whenever that's going on at home. And what happens is family breakdown, family disharmony, no peace, no love, and likely no faith either, no faith in God, because if that's the result, a man says he fears God and lives like that, who's interested in faith? Forget it, the kids will say, and the world as well. It's a serious problem whenever we live in sin as fathers. Or else as mothers. 
And at the same time, kids have responsibilities too. Today, especially, we hear about lack of respect for authority, many challenges to authority. One of the headlines in, I think it was in the St. Catherine Standard a week or two ago, when something like this, ever since COVID, teachers are having more challenges with students in school. They don't listen. They won't cooperate. They do their own thing. They just ignore authority. They reject it. And if it's at school, it's likely at home as well. Because when our relationship with God is broken, everything else begins to break down. And that's in our day, and it was in the days of our text. Really, ever since the fall into sin, it's been a problem everywhere. But here's why John is coming. Why God is sending him to turn sinners to the Lord their God. To turn the hearts of fathers to their children. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. In other words, John will call people everywhere to repent of everything and to walk in the way of true wisdom, in the fear of God and for the glory of God. John will call for that. And many will hear him and we know many will turn. At least outwardly, they will turn. Now, not all. God never says all. Even today, not all will turn. But under John's ministry, many will and many did. not They became awakened to their sin. They experienced conviction before the Lord. They saw they were in trouble. They realized they were in great danger. And so when John said, turn, they turned. And in this way, John was used by the Lord to prepare the people for Jesus to come. And they were ready to hear the gracious words that might proceed out of Jesus' mouth. But of course, all that's in the future here in Luke 1. The main point is that God is sending John. God is graciously sending John to call the people to repentance. And even as we hear that, we ought to ask ourselves, don't, shouldn't we? Have we repented? Are we turning? Is our life truly marked by this? Turning to God from idols. Turning from every known sin. If not yet, Let's realize we're in danger. If you're still in your sin, as the Bible says, then you're at the edge of hell. You're at the edge. And at any moment, you may fall in. And once you are in, you never get out. So the Lord's word to you this morning is to turn. Turn to the Lord. Turn from your sin. Whatever it may be. And, and if we say, yes, we, we have turned, we, we do turn, we're always turning to the Lord. That's, that's something in our life that's good. Is it clear also in our lives, and especially at home? In view of the text, then we have to say that. And start with fathers, us who are fathers, since the text highlights fathers. Fellow husbands and fathers this morning, we're not perfect. We never can be. But are we living in any sin. As we raise our children, are we setting for them godly examples? Are we invested in the upbringing of our children? Or are we sometimes too passive, letting too many things go? Maybe letting our wives do all the dirty work. Is that ever a problem? Or alternatively, are we perhaps too aggressive and harshly so? And maybe in our manner or in our tone or in our, in our overall approach, driving our children away from the Lord, not drawing them to the Lord. Wives and mothers might ask themselves the same question. But likewise, children and young people, if you say you are Christian, and we rejoice whenever we hear you say you want to follow the Lord. But is that also evident at home? Do you understand that it needs to be in how you relate to your parents, in how you treat your siblings, in how you contribute to home life? Because repentance is very specific and detailed, and all of us are confronted with John's call not to live in any conscious disobedience, 
Now, we cannot do that apart from Jesus. We need more than the ministry of John. And how thankful we may be that Jesus comes after John, both to forgive our sin and to renew our lives. And so it is by the grace of Christ, and it is by the power of the Spirit that we can be enabled to live in true repentance all our days. So we need more than John. And we have more than John. But let's not miss the importance of John. In the history of salvation, he comes to call for repentance. And likewise, in the experience of salvation, it's still that way. Even Jesus himself will say it. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so this matters. Repentance matters. If there is no repentance in your life, you are not yet a Christian. You are not yet a Christian. And the Lord calls you to become one through repentance and faith. And so we learn from this child that God is sending, even John. But, but how does Zacharias react to all of this good news? That's the last thing to see from our text this morning. And that's the unbelief God chastens, the unbelief that he chastens. Because, of course, Zacharias responds with unbelief, as we know. Verse 18, Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. So maybe you're thinking about that and you're thinking, what's wrong with that question? We'd probably all ask the same question if we were in Zacharias' shoes. Even now, even when we know the story, even now we may wonder to ourselves, how, how can this be? They're old. But God is not pleased with Zacharias. And through Gabriel, he makes that clear. First, Gabriel responds by introducing himself more formally. I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and to bring you these glad tidings. And then verse 20, he says, you did not believe my words. And that was true. And still we may wonder, is that fair? It, it was not possible for Zacharias and Elizabeth. Their biological clocks had long since passed the time when conception and birth might have happened, and it never happened when it was possible. How now could it happen when it's impossible? We may think we understand Zacharias and we can excuse him, but are we right about that? Let's not forget that Zacharias was an Israelite who no doubt knew Israelite history, including, for example, the experience of Abraham and Sarah when God gave to them Isaac as a child of their old age. If he did it before, can he not do it again? Didn't Zacharias remember? And what about the fact that as a priest, Zacharias was privileged to live very near to the Lord and to know him, more so than others, we might say. And, and even now, where was he? He was in the holy place. In, in, in terms of the Old Testament experience of God, Zacharias was so near to God. Didn't he know about the power of God? Didn't he believe that nothing is ever too hard for the Lord? But somehow Zacharias' faith had grown dim. That wasn't good. And what about the fact that before him was an angel? An angel? When do you see an angel or hear from an angel? Shouldn't that have helped him to be so confident in what the angel said? But he wasn't. How shall I know this? And it is unbelief. And it is wrong. And Zacharias is without excuse. And so the Lord will make a point with him. Zacharias has in essence asked for a sign. How can I know this? All right, Zacharias, here's how. From now on till your son is born, you will not be able to speak. You will be mute no sound will come from your mouth. You will not be able to articulate words. You will not be able to communicate as you always have. You will be mute. And so the Lord chastened Zacharias. The Lord zipped his lips. And that couldn't have been easy. Can you imagine not being able to speak for nine months at least? Yes, even as a man... Apparently men talk less than women. Someone told me that the other day. Maybe that's true. Maybe men talk less on average. But men still talk. And some men talk a lot. 
And in his work, Zacharias needed to talk with the other priests. And especially, he had an assignment when he came out of the holy place. He was supposed to stand and bless the people and speak words of blessing. But now he could not. And he couldn't even tell them why he could not. They were already anxious because he was taking so long. And when he came out the way he did, unable to speak, all he could do was beckon to them, gesture somehow, how frustrating for him and for them. Well, they concluded he had seen a vision, and they were sort of right about that, although it was more than a vision. Somehow Zacharias was able to finish his week of service. Couldn't have been easy. And then imagine him going home to Elizabeth. How did he ever explain things to her? Hopefully he could write. Hopefully she could read. What if she couldn't? Well, maybe he could draw out some pictures of an angel, of a child, of a... But he couldn't speak. And then day after day, week after week, month after month, he was unable to speak, and it was God's chastisement for unbelief. And don't we learn, congregation, that unbelief is a very serious sin. Do not be content to be an unbeliever. And never think, oh, it's not that bad. At least, at least I'm not a murderer, or an adulterer, or I'm not an idolater, or a blasphemer. It's, it's just unbelief. It's never just unbelief. Unbelief is a grievous sin, and the Lord won't let it go. And if despite Him calling you to faith, you still refuse to believe, maybe you've never yet believed, never yet entrusted yourself to the Lord, you know that you ought to, and yet for whatever reason you refuse to, do not be content with that. For God is not happy about that. You are only adding to your sin and increasing your debt every day, living foolishly and dangerously, which is why the Lord says, today, if you will hear His voice, turn to Him. Turn to Him. Or maybe in your walk with Him, you're a believer, but on different points, you have so much trouble trusting Him. And the way He's leading you, where he's taking you. No, no, no. You say, I don't like it. I can't trust. And you wonder about his wisdom. And you have trouble seeing his goodness. And you know better, but believing in his power. It's so hard, you say. What Christian doesn't understand. Like that man with the son who was so ill. And Jesus said, if you can believe. And he said, I believe, Lord. Help my unbelief. Because unbelief is a sin that needs to die in our life. Because God is true and trustworthy. Yes, see that even as he chastened Zacharias. See how he shows that in the mercy that may be found in the chastisement. I say, is there mercy in chastisement? Well, God is so wise in this regard also because remember how Zechariah said, how shall I know? In other words, can I have a sign? And so God gives him a sign. And, and he becomes mute and it, it feels like a discipline and it is a discipline and a hard discipline. And yet think how through the silence of Zechariah, he would have, as he came to understand, be reminded and encouraged because he would remember what Gabriel said in verse 20, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. And so Zacharias would have learned to see and to say, okay, well, he would have had to say it inside. Okay, God is true. God can be trusted. God is at work in this. John is coming. And after him, the Lord himself. My inability to speak is a divine confirmation. It was chastening, but there was a merciful blessing in the chastening. And the takeaway for us, congregation, even as we come to a close this morning, the takeaway is simply this, that the Lord, our Savior God, is entirely and eternally trustworthy. Just notice yet the last verses of our text. 
Verse 24. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And then it goes on to describe her response to that, including to hide for a while. Maybe until she might reemerge, obviously pregnant. Her reproach wiped away. The point is, God did what he said for Zacharias and Elizabeth. He did what he said so that he might do all that he has promised us in the gospel, including someday to send Jesus for sinners, unbelieving sinners like you and me. And what good news Jesus is above all. What a savior he is to all who turn to him and say, be merciful to me. And so let us rejoice over this text. And all that it teaches us. And let us believe in the Lord. And let this text help us with that. So that we all believe. So that it may overcome our unbelief. And that the evidence be that individually and as families and as a church. Increasingly we live like Zacharias and Elizabeth lived. Righteous before God. Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. Blameless. And with whatever way he takes us through life. Serving him with gladness. Amen. Let us pray. Lord our God, we thank you for sending Gabriel to Zacharias so unexpectedly, so wonderfully. And for the words he spoke, for the prayer that you heard, for the child you would send, and yes, even for the unbelief that you disciplined. It needed to be disciplined, and it must have been difficult. But yeah, we know there was mercy in the discipline, as there so often is, even today. And we pray, Lord, in thanksgiving that this passage points us ultimately to Jesus Christ. Because in your faithfulness to Zacharias and Elizabeth, you were being faithful to Israel, and you were being faithful to your promise, and you were being faithful to your people throughout the ages. For after John comes Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners, even for all who turn to him and trust in him. May May we all turn to him, Lord. May repentance mark our life and may it be that we walk in, in all the commandments of the Lord, blameless, through the grace and power of Christ and the Holy Spirit. We pray that you will bless your word this morning. Bless to each one of us and those who may have sat through this sermon and found it difficult because of particular sorrows in their life, maybe in the past, maybe in the present. Maybe never married. Maybe till now never having children. Maybe with children who have turned away from their upbringing. Maybe with children who have been taken early from life. Leaving an empty place. Lord, there can be so many sorrows that we carry. And we pray that you will meet each one this morning. And minister to them as only you can. And grant, Lord, that by way of your word and through all of the gospel, you may, you may so gently and kindly and faithfully lift up our heads to look up to you and to trust that your way is perfect, your word is sure, and you are a shield to those who confide in you. So as we go, Lord, from here, we pray for your blessing and that you may teach us with undivided heart to trust thy truth, thy name, to fear. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let us close with singing together from Psalter 233, stanza 4 and 6. 233, 4 and 6, and for our doxology, 155, 2, 3, and 4.
receive now the blessing of the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.